Welcome this morning and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We're so close. We're almost there. Would you please stand and sing with us as we celebrate the birth of Christ? You may be seated.
Welcome to David's Community Bible Church. We are so glad you are here today, or we are so glad you are at home watching today. Uh, it's great to, uh, to be able to worship to God together as the body of Christ. If this is your first time here, you haven't been back in a while, if you look at the pew back in front of you, you should see a card like this. If you will fill this out and bring it to the connection desk in the back, you will get a free Dunkin' Donut gift card. And uh, with the cold weather, a hot coffee is really nice. Uh, this time of year, so make sure you fill this out. Uh, that way we have a record of your visit and we can get you a Dunkin' Donut uh, gift card. If you're at home and you're like, man, I, I can't get one of those, you can fill it out online and go ahead and either on the website or the app, they have a connection card and you can fill that out. And I want to let you know too, uh, whether this is your first time here, or you've been here a while, there's a place for you here at David's. There's a place for you to learn. There's a place for you to get involved in a small group. There's a place for you to serve. Uh, there is a place for you to worship, and there is a place for you here, and we'd love to get you connected. That's why it's called a connection card, because we want to get you connected here uh, to the body of Christ at David's. So if you would fill that out for us. Also, I wanted to mention, uh, it's uh, the end of, getting close to the end of the year. Some of you are like, whew, this has been a terrible year. Uh, it's getting close to the end of the year, but... That means the start of a new Bible memory challenge. Uh, memorizing the Bible verses, uh, 2021. Uh, if, you, if you struggle with it last year, you're like, oh man, I didn't get finished. Uh, 20, 2021 is your year. You got it this year. You got it. Make a, a New Year's resolution uh, to do the Bible memory challenge. Or uh, you could always just, uh, like what I used to do for tests, you could just cram it all in in the last couple, couple weeks. Just, you know, unless you're still on like January, you might be able to pull it off. We also have the Bible reading program. These are in the back as well. You can get both of these, the memory challenge and the reading program. This goes chronologically through the Bible, uh, helps the Bible make sense as you read through it. Um, and... If you'll grab that, you can read through the whole Bible this year, or you can, if, you, if, you, if that's a little bit issues, you could just do the, the New Testament in 2021. But I, I strongly recommend that you uh, pick up the memorization and the Bible uh, reading program. All Sunday school classes are going to start on January 3rd, but I wanted to mention a new, specifically a new specific class. It's, uh, it's called the Engagement Project. It's starting up uh, that day on January 3rd. It's the follow-up to the Truth Project. So if you, if you don't have a Sunday school you, you're going to yet and you're like, man, I want to I be a part of one, that's a great one to be a part of. It's the engagement part, project starting up January 3rd. Uh, the Christmas Eve service will be here at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. That's always a great service, an encouraging service, and puts your mind and focus on Jesus uh, right before Christmas. So uh, make sure you put that on your calendar, Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m. And I know I'm usually up here each week... Uh, uh, especially lately and usually bringing bad news, but I want to bring some, some good news to you guys today. Uh, Alexandra House had her baby. They have a new little house baby. Uh, so that's, that's awesome news. It's exciting. Her name is Natalie Lillian Joy House. So I know you guys have been praying for them and uh, you can rejoice. Uh, beautiful baby girl and everybody's doing well. Christian and Alexandra are really excited. So uh, keep praying for them as well though. Um, nothing's wrong but they just have a lot of kids. So keep praying, <laughs> keep praying for them and, uh, and it'll be great to see, see the new baby when she gets here. New, new babies just bring life and joy and excitement. So, so I love that. Um, there is youth tonight uh, here at David's uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. 6 to 12th grade. I uh, hope to see you there tonight. Uh, my wife's making her famous uh, wing dip, and now I put it on the spot. Now I put the standard up here, so it's got You got to bring your A game tonight. Uh, great wing dip. We're gonna have a, a great time tonight. Uh, some uh, Christmas parties during small groups. So hope to see you all here tonight uh, if you are youth group age. And before we close in prayer, uh, Pastor Allen and I wanted to do a, a Belarus greeting. So. I, got, I think it's on. Uh, as you know, or as many of you know, maybe not all of you, but we have a sister church in Belarus, uh, Resurrection Church. Uh, pastor Stas, Pastor Sergey are the pastors there. They have some other pastors there, I, I believe, as well. But they're the two main leaders there. And we like to send a Christmas greeting to them. And they're going to send one to us. Uh, just as a way of encouragement, they're struggling with COVID. But if you've heard anything about the international news, you know in Belarus there's 
uh, riot, not riots, but protests and things against the government. They had an election that wasn't fair. I mean, you might have seen some of that. So it's really important that we can encourage our brothers and sisters in Belarus. So uh, I'm going to wish them Merry Christmas in, in, in a minute. And then I, I'd like all of you to turn up uh, and, and look up to Scott, who's on our camera, and wave. So I'm going to say Merry Christmas, and then we'll wave. Like, as a congregation, we'll all wave to our brothers and sisters in Belarus. So take some coordination. So I say Merry Christmas. And then we all turn around and we, we wave. I guess you could say Merry Christmas as you wave as well. That sounds, okay. So, on a count of three, all right. I'll, I'll, let me say, wait, what? what? Like, what if we mess it up? Can we do it? All right, again? let me do this over again. Let me just say a few things then. Ready, Scott? Okay. We just want to greet our brothers and sisters in Belarus and Resurrection Church. Uh, we thank the Lord for you. We are praying for you. We love you. And we want to wish you all a Merry Christmas as David's church. Merry Christmas. All right. We nailed it first try. That was good. That was good. I think Dale said it in Russian, Merry Christmas. I don't know. I heard something there. But go ahead. All right. Well, let me pray. Uh, pray for Belarus. Uh, pray for the house families. And uh, just pray for, for this church body as we begin this, uh, getting ready to begin this new year. God, I just, uh, I thank you for, thank you for this body of Christ. I thank you how encouraging it has been, um, how we lift each other up in the, in the hard times. God, I pray, uh, I pray for our sister church. God, I, I lift them up this morning. I pray for uh, the church in Belarus, Resurrection Church. God, I just, I, I know they are um, struggling with, with COVID and, and unjust governments and things over there. God, I just, I just pray that you encourage that church body. I pray that you encourage our brothers and sisters over there. God, I help them to have a, a great Christmas. And, and God, I just pray that they... Um, praise you this Christmas and, and keep their focus on you, God. And I pray that for us as well. God, I pray that we uh, keep our hearts and our minds focused on you this Christmas, God. And I, I uh, pray for the houses. I got to thank you uh, for this new life, God. Just an uh, amazing excitement that, that that brings, God. Life always brings excitement. So God, I just, I thank you for that blessing. What a blessing. Uh, what a blessing for them and what a blessing for our church. And God, I just uh, I pray for uh, the worship. I pray for the sermon today. God, I pray that we leave here encouraged today. I pray for the offering. God, I pray to use it in a mighty way for your kingdom and your glory. I pray this in your name. Amen. Stand and sing with us as we continue to worship together.
ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here unto the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Sing 
all read Luke 2, 15, 16, and 20 together. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. The shepherds went back to the flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. seated. I'd like to just say a quick thank you to, to Joanne and Mark for playing for us this morning. It is such a pleasure when they come. Thank you so much. Amen. And a big thank you to Kathy and her group as well as they filled in very admirably for Christian. And we're getting used to seeing them up here. Christian will be out for a few more Sundays, so you'll get You'll get to see them again. Thank you so much for serving and singing in that way. Uh, you can open your Bibles to Luke. Uh, children can be dismissed. Let me read that off the screen there. Children ages 4 to 2nd grade can be dismissed for junior church at this time as well. We don't want to forget about that. Okay, Luke. You can open to your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be skipping around a little bit. Usually I like to stay in one passage, but... I really want to, at this time, this year, the year of COVID, uh, the year of unrest, the year of uh, elections and political upheaval, all that's going on in this year, 2020, a year like Pastor Danny said, a lot of us are going to want to forget and move on to. Uh, and this year, it's important that, that I really want to address the topic of fear. Fear, worry, anxiety. Christmas, as we've been saying these last few weeks, is a time for hope and confidence and assurance in what God is doing and trust in what God is doing. That is the Christmas story that we trust in him and his good work and we battle against despair, hopelessness, and fear. We have hope. We've learned the last few weeks we have hope because God has spoken to us. We have hope because God rules over us. And today, we have hope because God cares for us. There is no reason for us to despair. There's no reason for us to get sucked into hopelessness at this time. There's no reason for us to fear. For us to fear. That's what we're going to talk about, fearing. Do you know the number one command uh, in the Bible is do not fear? Do not fear. And if one of you guys could turn the lights off, the, the can lights, that'd be great. Um, do not fear. 
That's the number one command. Almost a hundred times in the Bible, we see this do not fear. And if you put all the passages in the Bible that deal with fear, not just the ones that say specifically do not fear, but all the passages that address it, it comes out to almost 400 times in the Bible, this idea of fear. We are human beings. We are made of dirt and dust. We are weak. We are frail. We are sinners. And we are prone to fear. It's one of our biggest problems that we so easily fall into the trap of fear. And this time in the world, 2020, we're seeing a lot of fear. And the Bible says clearly that God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. This is not of the Lord. He does not want us to fear. And interesting, as we come to the Christmas story, and we see the interaction specifically with Gabriel, the, the messenger angel that comes to, to Zechariah, comes to Mary and, and Joseph and the shepherds, we see four times in four different interactions in the Christmas story, do not fear. We see the command, fear not. Three times, or four times we see that in the Christmas story. So I want to look at each of those times and see reasons for fear and then biblical reasons why we should not fear. So that's our topic today. We will have hope because God cares for us. We will not fear as believers in Jesus Christ. So let's pray and then we'll look a little bit uh, at this important topic. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would come and fill this place with your presence. That Christmas 2020 would be the most marvelous Christmas of all. Lord, I know this Christmas, we will, many of us will not be able to see loved ones that we are used to seeing. Uh, we won't be near people that we are used to being near to in, in times like this, and that's going to cause our hearts uh, sorrow, Lord. We, we want to be together. But we know because of sickness and other reasons, that may not be true for us. So I pray that your presence, your grace, your mercy, your goodness, your faithfulness, your love would fill in those gaps, Lord. Would fill in those gaps. Lord, we pray especially for those loved ones who are going to be in, in, in nursing homes or facilities uh, far away from us, Lord. And, and that breaks our hearts that we're not going to be able to see them, Lord. I pray in this time that you would fill in those gaps with your goodness and your love, Lord, and your joy. This is to be a joyous time as we celebrate the incarnation of the Son of God. As we remember that God came to us in the flesh to redeem us, to save us, Lord. Help this Christmas time to be filled with that like no other Christmas time. Help your people, the people of God, to minister, to love, to pray for those that are in need right now. Lord, we know that even in our congregation, there are many still, still suffering with, with COVID and suffering with sickness. Lord, be with them. Strengthen them. Heal them, Lord. Be with, with, with those in our midst that, that are dealing with sick people. Keep them safe. Be with those that have lost business and, and are losing business in this time of lockdown and shutdowns. Lord, be with them, Lord. There's so much going on. There's so many reasons for discouragement and fear. Lord, uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit would not allow that to happen in our hearts and in our minds, but might do the very opposite. Might give us all the reasons we have for hope, for real hope, that we might turn our eyes and lift our eyes to Jesus in this time, and that he might fill in all of those, those cracks and all those gaps, Lord. Pray that you would do this, Lord. Be with those who cannot be here today again, those that are sick and in hospital rooms and at home uh, in sickness, Lord. Bless them, heal them, strengthen them, Lord. Keep them safe. Heavenly Father, be with our nation, be with our president, our governor. Be with those that are placed in authority over us, Lord. Be in this time of unrest and upheaval. Bring peace, Lord. May your, your church, your people that, that also seem fractured in this time, may you bring them together and may we again be the voice of hope and truth in this time of unrest. Lord, help us to do that as your followers, Lord. Not just on a national or global scale, but locally in our neighborhoods and our communities, Lord. As we talk to our neighbors as we shovel snow, as we go about our days and, and plan for Christmas, Lord, may it be a time of great witness that we might be able to, to share with others around us the good hope, the real hope that we have in Jesus Christ and his death for us. Lord, give us those opportunities, Lord. Give us those opportunities, we pray. Be with those that are serving us, Lord, uh, here in our communities and around the world. Bless them, Lord, as they keep us safe Lord, uh, bless them, especially in this Christmas time. We think of our military folk, especially as many of them, most of them are away from their loved ones during Christmas. Bless them, especially uh, as they are far from home. Lord, keep them safe too. 
Lord, and for us as we come before your word again here today, Lord. Uh, bless us as we look into your scriptures. I pray that each of us would receive exactly what we need from your word, from your Holy Spirit. Encourage us today, strengthen us uh, today, Lord. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So as I said, uh, our topic today is fear. Fear. So let me, let me give you, before we look at some of the, the, the reasons not to fear in Scripture, let me give you some facts about fear. Facts on fear. And these are ones that you know. And the first thing, uh, fear is common to, to us as human beings. Fear is common. I don't know if you can see that chart on the screen, but you have it in your notes or on your app as well. But this is a, a study taken from the New York Times I found online that was taken this year, 2020, and we're seeing across the board reported that fear is on the rise in our nation. It's on the rise. More people are afraid now than ever before. And, and some of the things that they're afraid of, the New York Times surveyed these people. I'm not quite sure how, how wide the survey was or, or how exhausted. We see number one is that the next generation will be worse off than us. That's, a, that's the number one fear in this study. 57% of people say they are very fearful of that. 26% said somewhat. You can see that list. Losing American democracy, getting sick with COVID. Um, climate change, climate harm, unable to speak your mind, 37% are very fearful, 23% are somewhat fearful. Community changing for the worse, losing my job, my income, being a victim of crime. You can see these things, and as you look at this list, say, well, those are things I think about too. Those are things I think about. Those are things I see and that, that I'm seeing concern for in my life as well. And these are the things that can lead us to fear, like no other time. Fear is common. Fear is common. Secondly, fear is corruptible. Fear is corruptible. When we, when we surrender to fear and allow fear to control us, it corrupts us. It corrupts us. Fear, listen closely, fear is sinful. To respond in fear is sinful. Okay, most sin, I mean, there's some healthy fears, like you, you should fear alligator attack. That's not a sinful fear. That's a real fear you should have. If you're in Florida, a place where alligators roam free, you should have a healthy fear of alligators, right? Right? You're with me on that, right? Have you ever been to Florida? And they have signs that have, have like, 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 a, like a person in a wheelchair or a baby crawling towards water and an alligator coming out and, and they have this, you know, we should have, there's some healthy fear. I'm not, I'm not talking about healthy fear. I'm talking about sinful fear. We, we, that, that, is, that, that can corrupt us. That is a weapon of Satan. 2 Timothy 1.7 is a verse you should memorize, you should have in your memory banks because it says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear but a power, right? And of love and of self-control. God does not give us spirit of fear. If you live in a spirit of fear, that is not from the Lord. That is from Satan. That is from your flesh. That is sinful. We should not be controlled by fear. We can struggle with fear. We can battle fear. All those things, that's what we do as Christians, but we cannot be controlled by fear. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing people in our nation, in our culture, around the world, people in, in, in churches, Controlled by fear. You know where you see it? Where you see it almost uh, blatantly is how we raise our children now. We raise our children in fear. Fear. We are scared to death of what may happen to our kids. Again, there's good fear, healthy fear. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about the, the overprotection, the safe spaces that colleges now have to have because people are afraid. They're afraid they might hear something they don't agree with. You know, when I grew up, we, we would get on our bicycles and we would ride for days before you came home, ride for hours. Right now, parents make what's called play dates. If you're a parent, you make a play date, right? Now, some of that's okay, but the exaggeration, that it, it, it could be a response by fear. We're seeing, we're seeing lockdowns around the nation because of COVID. We're seeing mandatory masks. We're seeing riots in the street. We're seeing division based on race again. When did this come back into, into the, the forefront of our nation where people are now being separated by the color of their skin? I thought we were beyond this. This is what we're seeing in our nation and people are responding to all of these things in fear. In fear. that We have to battle fear as believers. The church of Jesus Christ is drowning in fear and we're trying to tell the world around us don't fear when they look at the church and we're just as fearful as they are, if not more. You know, contemporary Christian music, all they have is songs about don't fear, we're not slaves to fear, don't be afraid. And we're more afraid than we've ever been. We're more afraid than we've ever been. This is not the spirit of God working in us. And the more we, 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 we are controlled by fear, the more it corrupts us and harms us. Fear is conquerable. 
As believers in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in us, strengthens us, and gives us, gives us power to defeat fear in our lives. If you go through Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, if in this last year we've read through Scripture, that's a challenge to our church. You just heard Pastor Danny. We have another challenge this year to read through the Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. You'll find the handout in the back. It's a, it is a very good thing to do as a believer, read through the Bible each year. So we challenge you to do that as long as memorize the Bible. Those are two good things we should be doing as believers. But if you've read through the Bible this year, you read from Genesis to Revelation, you will find... That there's no one in the Bible that God uses in significant ways for his kingdom and for his glory that, that don't have to overcome fear. It's mandatory. If you want to be used by God, you are going to have to overcome fear. There's no shortcut around it. It is a necessary block that must be defeated in your life to be used by God. It is. I don't know of anyone in the Bible, off the top of my head, that, that didn't have to struggle with fear and overcome fear some significantly significantly because fear is that that first thing and when God calls us to something that wants to pull us back down you can't do that you're not able to do that who's God to ask you to do that fear is the first enemy we must defeat if we're going to do anything for the Lord you know one, one of the heroes of the Bible one of the amazing people in the Bible is, is someone we've been studying through the book of Acts that's the Apostle Paul you look at the Apostle Paul he's the most fearless guy in the Bible he didn't fear he didn't have any fears, right? Yes, the Apostle Paul even feared. Acts 18, 9, it says, The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, God came to Paul and spoke to him in a vision. What was his message? Do not be afraid. Go on speaking. Go on speaking. Do not be silent. Even the Apostle Paul struggled with fear. We struggle with fear. This is a human condition. We are sinners. We are frail. We are fragile. We struggle with fear. But we cannot be dominated by fear. Fear is conquer comparable. Conquerable. Fourthly, this is a bit of a stretch, but I want to stick with the C's. Fear is celestial. Celestial. What I mean by that is, <laughs> it's a little silly, but what I mean by this is when an angel appears to you, if an angel ever does appear to you, you will respond in fear. It's a really scary thing for an angel to appear to someone. That's what we see in the Christmas story. We see the angels, the angel Gabriel, the messenger angel of God, appearing to people, and their first response, which is the correct response, is fear. Is fear. If anyone ever tells you, that an angel appeared to them and they just sort of had a conversation with the angel. They're, that's not true. There's not one biblical example of that. If an angel ever appears to you, if that ever happens to you, which is extremely rare, but if ever, you'll be flat on your face, scared to death. It's a horrifying thing to come face to face with an angel. We see this in the Christmas story. We see that throughout the scriptures. It, it, this isn't a, a sermon about angels, but, but angels are not beautiful women. Right? That's not an angel. We use that in our phrase. Oh, she's an angel. The, 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 angels are, are men... And they're terrifying. They're, they're warriors, right? They fight. They're the host of heaven. They're the army of heaven. They're terrifying. They're not cute, chubby little babies either. You know, that's not an angel either. These are how, how we've sort of mutated this. They are terrifying celestial beings that fly and were created for battle. They carry the weapons of battle with them. They fly. They're terrifying to see an angel. So, in the Christmas story, we see four interactions with angels, and we see the proper response, the necessary response, which is fear. Physical fear. But beyond physical fear, in the Christmas story, we also see fear, or, or maybe the fear is not the, the right word, but, but an unknown. Because an angel is terrifying, but, but also what the angel says is usually pretty scary, too. Angels just don't show up to give you messages like, hey, uh, don't forget Tuesday is taco night, you know, or, or, you know, don't forget to pick up groceries. Your wife wants you to pick up groceries. They they're not like, they don't give ordinary messages, right? If an angel shows up to you and has a message from God, it's going to be a pretty big, serious deal, okay? It's, it's a big deal. Like, you're going to bear the Son of God. What? Wow. Yeah, those are the kind of messages angels give to people. So th there's not just fear of the angel's presence, there's fear of what the message is. If the angel said there's something big going to happen in your life, God's going to call you to something big and amazing, and that elicits a, a response of fear. Typical response after you get up off the floor by being seen, angel, is how can this be? How can this be? What in the world? This can't be right. You came to the wrong person. God can't expect me to do this. That's impossible, right? You know what angel says a lot in the Christmas story? With man, this is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. That's their message because it's an impossible message. The answer to fear, the fear of, of what the angel may seem, or, or any fears that we have, is always hope. Have hope. God cares for you. Do not fear. So I want to go through these interactions briefly and talk about what 
fear is there and then what the response is and what we can learn from their responses. So let's look at the first interaction of an angel with a person. That's Zechariah. Luke chapter 1. I had to turn there there in the beginning. You've been waiting patiently there. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5. Luke 1, 5 to 13. This is, this is that first interaction. In the days of Herod, the, Herod, king of Judah, we talked about that last week, what that meant, those dark days of Herod, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren. And both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, his division was on duty. According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense in the temple. Just him and Zechariah. And verse 12, Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. I'm going to stop right there. There's a great ending to this story, but we're not going to go that far today. We're looking at his fear. So we're introduced to this man, Zechariah. He's a good man. He's a blameless man. He's a righteous man, and he has a good, blameless, righteous wife, Elizabeth. It's a great story. They're advanced in years, they're old in years, they're beyond the childbearing age, and yet they're childless their entire marriage, their entire lives. For decades, they've been childless. She's been barren. Now, as we read through the New Testament, in the Old Testament, you know how people sort of looked on this, right? If there was something wrong in your life, if you were sick, if you were handicapped or barren or didn't have any children, people would assume what of you? Something wrong with you. You sinned. So here's Elizabeth, this blameless, righteous woman who lives before God, that you can assume that her community around her looked at her with suspicion. There's something wrong with her. There's something wrong with Zachariah because if there wasn't something wrong, they would have children. This is wrong. They're, they're living in sin. There's a hidden sin there. Read John chapter 9 and how they treat the blind man. This was typical uh, of the place. If something bad was in your life, it was because you were sinful. So here they are living under the stigma and they're righteous people who love God and they're presenting their request before God asking day after day. This was probably a daily request of Zechariah. Lord, give my wife Elizabeth a child. Prayed this day after day, decade after decade. And here he is. This was a very unique time, very special time that you would be chosen to burn incense. This is probably a once in a lifetime thing. Very unique thing to go in the temple and burn incense. This is not something Zechariah probably ever did again. Very unique. He goes in there. What's on his mind? He's probably in his 80s. He's an old guy. He's advanced in years. He's long beyond the childbearing age. He's long beyond that. They're advanced in years. That's what scripture says. But yet he goes there and we can assume that that's his prayer. Lord, give my wife a child. Lord, you gave Sarah a child in her old age. She was 90 when she got pregnant. Lord, you can do this again. This is his daily prayer. This is his, his prayer. Because as he's gone before God and his fear has been all these years is that God has forgotten us. God has forgotten us. That's what Zachariah is afraid of. God's not listening. God's not hearing. You know, when I pray, it feels like the prayer hits the ceiling and just bounces right back to me. God's not listening. God's not acting on my behalf. He says he loves me. He says he answers prayer. He says he hears me. He's forgotten me. He's forgotten me. God doesn't hear my prayers. For decades he's been praying this prayer and he hasn't had any assurance that God is listening. Maybe you feel this way. Maybe this is very real to you. You feel that, that God's forgotten you, has not heard your request, that your prayers have bounced from the ceiling back down. Maybe you've been praying for something, maybe as long as Zachariah, maybe you've been praying for something, the, the salvation of a loved one, that you've been praying for this. I don't know what it might be, but maybe this is exactly where you are, Zachariah. Says, is God even listening? Does God even care? That's the heart of Zachariah. That's the heart of Zachariah. He's been praying. God has forgotten. But why should Zachariah have hope? Look at verse 13. The angel said to him, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. God has not forgotten you, Zechariah. Why should he not be afraid? There's your answer. Your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. That's a reason for hope. God hears your prayers. He hears every one of your prayers, every one of your utterances, everything that you've spoken to him. He hears and he answers. 
That, that's, what, that's the lesson we have, that God hears us and he answers us always. God always hears us and always answers us. It may not be the answer you want. I'm not saying it's always a yes. Sometimes when we pray, we get no's. But that doesn't mean God's not listening. That doesn't mean God doesn't hear us. He always hears us. And when you pray to the Lord and you, 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 you give your requests to the Lord and you present them to the Lord, you have to realize that God will say no, maybe to, to a lot of those requests. God will say no, but the point of prayer is not that we get what we want from God. That's not why we pray, that we get what we want. We pray, and the reason for prayer is that we communicate with the God of the universe. That's why we pray. Because we want to hear from him and he listens to us. It's about growing in our relationship. So even if Zachariah does not get John as a child, which he will, but even if the answer is no and God's will for Zachariah and Elizabeth is to be barren their entire lives, if that's God's will for them, that's how they're going to bring glory to God, that doesn't mean God doesn't hear his prayers. We need to remember this, that even if the answer is no, he is listening, he loves you, he cares about you, he has a good plan for you, He's hearing you, even if it's no. Even if it's no, God hears our prayers and cares for us and loves us. He's always listening. It's important for us to understand that prayer is not mainly to get things, but to talk to God, to be in relation to God. The more we pray, the more intimate of a relationship we will have with our Heavenly Father. Okay? It's not a transactional thing. God does say, ask and you will receive. He wants us to ask from him, but the purpose of asking and communicate is for this relationship that we grow in the relationship. If you're not praying, you're not growing in your relationship with God like you should be. Pour your heart out to God. Pour it out to God. Pray to God. Have hope. Do not fear. Why? Because God hears your prayers. In fact, if anything, in 2021, pray more. Talk to God more. When you're driving along, when you're sitting at home, I don't know what you're doing. Talk to the Lord. Make it normal for you to be in conversation with the Lord. Pray without ceasing, the Apostle Paul says. Be in constant communication with your Heavenly Father. And you'll grow in this relationship. And you will not fear. Zachariah. The second person we see an angel appear to is Mary. Is to Mary. Maybe this is the most famous appearing of an angel to someone. We have this beautiful story in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Luke 1, 26, just a couple paragraphs away. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth and to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. There's our command. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give, him, give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For not, there it is, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We see Mary and, and all commentators uh, looking at the tradition of Israel, looking at the situation at the time, agree that Mary, the, 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 the person of Mary would be very, a very young woman. 14, 15, 16, somewhere. That's what, that is when women got married in ancient Israel. They got married very young. So here she is, this young teen. Young teen. Don't think of her as a, as, as a woman at this time, but a young teen still growing, still maturing. So she is there. She's engaged to, to Joseph, who's probably a, an older man. Joseph probably dies sometime in the Gospels. It doesn't say when, but we can assume that because Jesus seems to be the head of the family at some time. So Joseph might have been older than her. And, and very clearly, she, she is a virgin. How can this be? I'm a virgin. I can't give birth. Not only that, but she is a nobody from nowhere. She's from Nazareth. Remember, remember what Nathaniel said. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth is, Nazareth is the backwoods of the backwoods. You know, it, it's as far away as you can get. In ancient maps of Israel, they didn't even put it on maps. That's how out of the way it was. 
Okay, this is the backwoods of the backwoods. This is way out there. This is, this is nowhere, and she is a nobody, poor nobody from nowhere. But she was righteous. She was righteous. And we see this because if you read on in her story, we don't have time to, to talk about her whole story today, but if you read on and you see her song, her Magnificat, in Luke 1, 46 to 56, you see a mature faith there as she praises God for his goodness, his mercy, his might, his power, his control. Of all these things, it's a, it's a list of, of how good God's been her. So, so as you see her pour out her heart, you can see the maturity that she has in the Lord. As a side note, this is a great encouragement for us who see, you know, we just talked about how we're trying to keep our young people safe all the time and how damaging that could be to them. But this is a great encouragement to say that our young people, teenagers, can be spiritually mature. That we can expect a lot from them. And, and, and it's getting to the point, I think, in the Church of Jesus Christ in America that if, if things are going to change in America and the church is going to become the church again like we want it to, it's going to have to be through our young people, I think. I really think that's true. It's going to have to be through our young people. Those you look at our youth group and our young college kids and, and, and below, these are the people who are going to have to lead us back to where we should be as a church of Jesus Christ. I think a lot of us as adults, we've done a lot to, to screw up the church of Jesus Christ. And it's going to have to be our young people who are going to have to call us back to it. And God's going to, God works through young people. Read the scriptures. Look at how many young people like Daniel, like Mary, like Joseph, these young people. Some of the disciples could have been very young men that, that Jesus Christ called in discipleship. Young people. It's, we need to be encouraged by that and, and see this and look at Mary. There is potential. Mary, again, is not supernatural. She's not super special. I know some people put her in that category incorrectly. Biblically, she is a regular human being like we are. She is a sinner like we are. She has the same resources that we have. She is just like us. She's a human being. She's a sinner. She needs a Savior just like us. Nothing special about Mary in that regard. So here's Mary. There's her situation. And her fear, as she talks to the angel, her fear is that God does not understand. Look what she says in verse 34. How will this be? I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense. I'm not even married. I've never been with a man. I can't have babies. There's no, there's no possible way. A lot of times we want to think that people in Scripture 2,000 years ago were just, you know, stupid and unenlightened. They didn't know how science worked or anything. Let me tell you something. They knew how babies were born. They knew how it worked. And she says, it doesn't work. I can't, I can't have a child. Doesn't God know that I'm a virgin? Doesn't God know that I'm unmarried? Doesn't God know that this pregnancy, if I do get pregnant, will lead to all sorts of trouble for me? They didn't look kindly on young women who were pregnant out of wedlock. That was not, not good in the ancient world. It's not good even today. That stigma's still there, but not like it was there. As she hears this, as she accepts this, she says, I'm the servant of the Lord. She realizes that if God does not intervene, and God does, but if God did not intervene, it would mean that she'd be rejected from her family, she'd be rejected from Joseph, she'd be rejected from her synagogue, her community. Everything around her that she knows would reject her because of the sinfulness that she was in. And in Deuteronomy even says that you can stone a woman who's pregnant out of wedlock. It could even mean her life. This is what God, God, does God know what he's asking of me? The people of Nazareth may stone me if I'm pregnant out of wedlock. He doesn't understand. Did, did God work out all the scenarios here? Does he know what's going to happen? Ever feel this way? That God just doesn't get it with you? That, that, that this can't be right? That, that God's not paying attention to you? That somehow in your life and what you're going through, God has just been not paying attention? You ever feel that way? Yeah, that's how my life has played out. I, is God even watching over? Is he, is he, does he even care what's happening in my life? Does he know what's going on? Why would God allow this in my life? Why would God uh, make me do this? Why would God call me to this? Why would God put this situation in my life? This isn't going to work out. God, what's going on? That's how Mary felt. That's how Mary, that was the, the fear that, that Mary was struggling with, if you will. But the angel answers her and gives her a reason to not fear, to have hope. Look at verse 30. Why should Mary have hope? Look what the angel says to her. Do not be afraid, Mary. Why? Why? You have found favor with God. Mary, you don't understand something. You have found favor with God. You say, wow, isn't that great that Mary has found favor with God? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you the truth of Christmas. You, too, if you know Jesus, have favor with God. You're just like Mary. You know, the word favor here, and I'm not quite sure why translations 
make it favor, but most of the English translators do. The word here is grace. I don't know why they just don't translate grace. You have found grace with God. This is grace. Unearned, unmerited, undeserved blessing and acceptance and forgiveness of God. That's what grace is. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You don't, you, in no way have you done anything to receive it. God has given it to you. Mary did nothing to be the, the, the mother of Jesus Christ. It's not like she deserved this, this great honor. She didn't deserve it. She has been given grace by God for this task. And we too have received grace. If you're saved today, you are favored of God. You are highly favored of God. God favors you as much as he favors Mary. Okay, Mary doesn't have a special place in heaven or a special place. She's just like us. She did something extraordinary, something no one else did, but she's just like us. She needed the favor of God. She needed the grace of God. She needed a Savior to pour out his love and grace for her on the cross. And he did for his mom, Mary, and for us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you've been saved. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one should boast. Every believer in Jesus Christ can say, I am favored of God. God favors me. Just like Mary. No difference. In fact, I'll tell you this. At this point in the story, we have more grace than Mary has. It is more blessed to have Jesus in your heart than to have him in your womb. It's more blessed to have him in your heart, reigning in your heart as Lord and Savior, than it is to give birth to him. Did you know that? That's a more blessed position. And one day Mary will come to believe in her son. But at this point, it is more blessed to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and have him live in your heart than even giving birth to him. That's how favored we are. God lives in our hearts. The Holy Spirit lives in us if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. God, Jesus Christ lives in us. He's poured out his grace for us. He died for us. We are favored by God. What in the world do you have to fear? If God is for you, who's against you? What are you afraid of? God, Jesus Christ lives in you. And yes, some of you are going through hardships and sorrow right now. But scripture says very clearly, Apostle Paul says very clearly in Romans chapter 8, whatever you're going through, no matter how horrific it is right now, it's not even worth comparing to the joy that awaits you in heaven. He is a good God, and he favors you. Remember that in 2020. Remember that when these terrible stories and terrible things we see, that people have passed away and people have gotten sick, we see all, the, all these things happening on the national scale, on the local scale, in our own lives and around the world. Remember this, you are highly favored of God. You're highly favored of God. Do not fear, have hope. You are favored by God, just like Mary. That's an answer to fear that gives us hope. Thirdly, let's look at Joseph, the other half of Mary. Mary and Joseph, this amazing man. Mary is amazing. Joseph, he often doesn't get his, his fair uh, part of the story, I think. He's an amazing man. Matthew chapter 1 is where we'll go to see uh, Joseph's interaction with the angel. Matthew 1 verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had, betro was be had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear, there it is, do not fear, fear not, to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, the name means salvation. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So we see this interaction with Joseph. This, this man, Joseph, is a good man. He's a just man. He's a righteous man. And that's what we see. The, the first three interactions, what we're seeing is righteous. We're seeing Zachariah and Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph. These are righteous people, obedient, godly people. He's a just man, verse 19 says, which means he's a good man. He's a righteous man. He's so good that even though he's been shamed by Mary, at least he thinks he's been shamed by her pregnancy and rejected and betrayed. Can you imagine the hurt this man feels? That he says, I'll divorce her, but I'll divorce her quietly. 
That means a lot of things. It means he's going to save her some shame, but it also means he won't bring charges against her. As a betrothed, he could bring charges against her, and that could lead to her stoning, perhaps. He says, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to honor her, even though she's seemingly betrayed me and committed sin against me, and I'm, 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 I'm devastated. He says, I'm going to do that quietly because he's a, he's a good man. He's a, he's a just man. And, and, and ultimately, he's obedient to what the angel says. One example Joseph is to, to men today, how he leads his family, how he leads and, and keeps them safe through the whole story. He's a, he's a good, just man, obedient to what God would have him do. But when the angel comes to him, what is Joseph afraid of? Well, I, I think Joseph is afraid of, at least in the beginning, that God made some kind of mistake. How can this be? How can this be? There, there must be some mistake. Mary's pregnant, and that's wrong. That's sinful. How can God do anything with this? That's not right. He, he doesn't understand that this is a virgin birth. He's going to come to understand that. But, but God must have made a mistake. What is God doing? This is wrong. Mary is pregnant out of wedlock. This can't be the way that God would, would have us go. This doesn't seem right. This seems wrong. Maybe you feel this way, that God's made a mistake in your life. Well, God, why would you have this happen to me? Why would you put me through this? Why would you allow this? This doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. I can't, I can't reason out what you're doing in my life right now. It, it, looks, it, it doesn't look right. There's no way I can endure this. There's no way I can, I can get through this. You've called me to something that, that I can't do. You're allowing something in my life that I can't endure. This, this, this shouldn't be happening. So many Christians say that as they look at their lives, they look at their circumstances. This shouldn't be happening. I remember years ago, in my last church, a, a woman came to my office and, and, and was seeking the Lord, and we spent time together, and I led her to the Lord, and we, we, she began to grow in the Lord, began to plug in, and then something really terrible in her life, I can't remember, I think her, her, one of her parents died, or she lost her job, and I remember her storming in my office one day and saying, if this is what it means to follow God, I have no interest in following God. I thought that, that everything in my life would, would be good and perfect after accepting Jesus, and this is what he does to me, I have no interest in this God anymore. I never saw her again, that was it. That, that, that's for this. That, that there's some mistake. This isn't, this isn't what I signed up for. This can't be right. This can't be right. But why shouldn't Joseph be fair? Why should, shouldn't Joseph make this mistake uh, or believe this about God? Look at verse 20. The angel gives him the answer. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Why? For what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. This Whatever your this is, we all have different this is, right? For, for Joseph, this was a, was a pregnancy out of wedlock that looked like sin. That was his this. What is your this? This is from the Holy Spirit. I don't know what your this is, but I know the second half is true because it's true for Joseph, it's true for you. Whatever your this is, whatever your circumstances are, whatever's going on in your life, it's from the Holy Spirit. It's from the Holy Spirit. God is in control. God is sovereign. It is from the Holy Spirit. You can count on that. You can know that. That God knows exactly what he's doing in your life. And he's in total control of what is happening. This is his plan. And his plan is always amazing and more marvelous than you can ever imagine. It may look dark right now, but joy comes in the morning. There will be victory. There will be light at the end of the tunnel. Goodness will reign. Righteousness will reign. Jesus reigns in your life. I don't know how dark it looks. I don't know how dark your this is right now. But I can tell you, because Scripture tells us that it's from the Holy Spirit. He is at work in your life. What's the alternative? It's not from the Holy Spirit? Then who is it from? That God's not in control? Then who is in control? That's terrifying. I know some of you struggle with an idea of a sovereign God in control of everything, even evil and bad things, that God's somehow in control. You struggle with that, but think what the alternative is, that God's not in control of something? That's really terrifying. I find comfort in that, that no matter what the this is in our lives, I can be confident that the Holy Spirit's involved with this, that it is according to his plan, that he will be glorified in this, that he's in control this is from the Holy Spirit. Have hope. Do not fear. Why? Why, as a Christian, can you, can you never, ever fear? And, and why is it always wrong for you to fear? It's always wrong for you to fear. And you should never fear because this is true. The Holy Spirit is in control. This is from the Holy Spirit. There could never be a legitimate cause to fear or live by fear. Why? Because God's in control. If God was not in control, then you have every reason to fear. You should be terrified. What are you doing here, as a matter of fact? You should be digging a, a bomb shelter right now if God's not in control. That's what you should be doing. You should be home 
storing up canned goods and digging a bomb shelter and buying ammunition. I don't know, something. If God's not in control, that's what you should be doing. Because there's a lot of scary things in the world. A lot of scary places in the world. But we don't live in fear. We live in hope and confidence. We're wise. I'm not saying we're not wise. We're wise, but we're not fearful. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, this is from the Holy Spirit. This is all according to God's plan. And God's plan can be hard sometimes. I'm not trying to diminish that. God's plan can be hard. But you need to realize that he's in control. And there's a lot of people, when they get to heaven, a lot of this will wash away. But a lot of will say, God, I need to know, what was that all about? What was that all about? I, I, you know, why, why was I born in communist Russia? USSR. Why, why did I go through persecution? Why was I put to death for my faith? Why didn't my, my child live? Why, did, why, why, why? I don't know. I, and I think a lot of that when we're in the face of Jesus Christ will be washed away. But, but, but we'll understand why when we get to heaven. It's from the Holy Spirit. We need to believe that. It's important we believe that. Okay, one more interaction with angels and fear. The shepherds, the shepherds. There they are out on this cold winter's night watching their flocks by night you know the song you know the scripture and the angels appear to them and, and perhaps they have the most terrifying uh appearance of angels because they get a whole host of angels which means host means army a whole army of angels appear to these poor guys minding their own business one dark night in bethlehem verse 8 luke chapter 2 verse 8 in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. It's King James, they were sore afraid. They're sore afraid. They're really afraid. They're sore afraid. Not so, but sore. With a, you, know, you know what I'm saying, if you have King James. And the angel said to them, fear not. Here's our command. Do not fear. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It was Christ's word, verse 11. There's more. I want to read more, but for, for the sake of time, what we're talking about. These are the shepherds. Who are, who are the shepherds? Well, we, we did a, I did a sermon a few years ago about the shepherds, and you have to realize that at this time in, in, in the history of Israel, shepherds were not seen in a very great light. They, they, you would, these were typically scoundrels. These were like uh, gypsies or, or unwanted people that would travel around with these animals. They were unclean. They were unwanted. If you saw them come into town, you would lock your, your, your doors. I remember as a kid, we lived in New Jersey, we would drive through New York City quite a bit, and I remember my mom, when we'd go through the tunnel, she'd say, lock the, back then you had to lock the, door, lock the doors down, lock, we're in the city, lock, you know, so that's what, when we saw the shepherds, you lock the doors, you close the, you put the blinds down, watch out, these are criminal types, these are real rough types you don't want in your town, they were scoundrels. This was not something that was an honorable position. Although in, in the scriptures, shepherds have a very honorable picture. God is the, the, the great shepherd, right? He compares himself to a shepherd. But at this time, they were, they were basically unclean. Scout, they couldn't worship because they were unclean. They couldn't uh, be around people. So number three, the shepherds were the least expected people you would expect to show up to, to praise uh, the, the new Savior born. They are the last people you'd expect. I mean, if you were planning a welcome party, you would, you would you go to the, the palaces. You would go to Caesar Augustus in Rome or, or Herod or somewhere and say, you know, you need to get out because the king of kings has been born tonight. And you wouldn't have him born in the stable in Bethlehem. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't have the shepherds there. But this is God's plan. So here are the, here are the, the shepherds and the angels appear and they're, they're sore afraid, of course, because they see the angels. But what is a shepherd's fear? Well, shepherd's fear is that God doesn't care about us, right? We're shepherds. We're nobodies. Uh, why would God care about us? No one else cares about us. Nobody else cares about us. No, 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 no rabbi comes out to teach us. No synagogue welcomes us. The temple doesn't want us. We can, we're not welcome in the temple because we work with animals and we're unclean because of that. We go into a, we go into a town and people grab their children and run for cover. No one cares about us. We're nobodies. Why would God care about us? I don't know what the angels thought that day, but if a bunch of angels showed up to them, they might think, this is it for us. <laughs> this is judgment. These angels know what I just did. You know, they, they know what kind of character. Uh, this is it for us. Angels don't appear for no reason. They're here to, they're here to judge us, perhaps. Maybe you felt this way. Just these all, maybe you felt that God doesn't care about your life. 
And you look at the circumstances and the situations that you're struggling with. So how, 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 where, where's God in this? How does God care? God, God's forgotten me. God doesn't, doesn't care. I'm not an important person. Look at the story of Christmas. It's a story of absolutely ordinary people that God does extraordinary things through. God very rarely picks the extraordinary people to do extraordinary things. He picks the ordinary people. Mary, Joseph from Nazareth, shepherds, uh, an old priest and his, and his wife that, that's forgotten, shepherds that nobody wants. These are the people that God calls to do extraordinary things through. And I'm here to tell you, it's the same way with God today. He's not looking for extraordinary people. In fact, the more extraordinary you are by the world standard, the less chance really you have of coming to salvation or being used by God because you filled your life up with so many other things. There's no room for God. God uses ordinary people. You know why the shepherds should have hope? You know why they should have hope? Because of what Jesus says, what, what the angels say to him. Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for some of the people. No. The, 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 the people deserve it, people. No. No, all people. I think the word that encourages us and encourages shepherds is the word all. All the people. Even you. Even sinners and scoundrels. Even rejects that nobody wants. Even murderers like the Apostle Paul. God, God came for us. Even us. Even scoundrels like us. Even sinners like us. Even old barren couples. Even nobodies who live in Nowhereville called Mary and Joseph. God, God says, I, I look at the ordinary. I look at shepherds. I look at scoundrels. I look at sinners. And those are my people. Those are the people that this good news is for. All people. And we need to remember this because we're living in a, in a time now, for whatever reason, I don't know why. I have my suspicions. But, but for whatever reason, we're living in a time, at least in our world, where people are increasingly being divided up again by economics, by position, by skin color, by sexuality, by whatever. We're, we're being divided up and put in different categories. It's called intersectionality. It's called, it's called critical race theory. It's called uh, identity politics. Whatever you might call it. it, has all these names, but we're starting to look at people and divide them up, and we forget the all in this. God died for all people. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your bank account is. I don't, I don't care what, you, what you've accomplished in this world. Those things are so irrelevant. The most irrelevant, boring thing about a person is the color of their skin. It's the most stupid thing to talk about. It's the most irrelevant thing. It's the most boring thing. But that's how we're seeing. We're, we're, we're going against this verse. This is good news for all people. Not just Jews. Not just religious people. Whatever it might be. That God gives us this great reason for hope for all people. Not just for those who deserve it because no one deserves it. This is, the, this, is the, this is the cadence of the gospel, isn't it? This is what Jesus says again and again. I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. I came for prisoners, to release prisoners. I came for those that, that, are, that, that are sinners, not self-righteous. These are the people that he came for. I didn't come for perfect people. There are no perfect people. I came for the people who know they're not perfect. I came for those who know they're blind and need to see. Not for those who think they can see already. I came for scoundrels. Like the shepherds. This is a, such an important example and lesson for us to learn. That the, the, the very ones that God ordained before the beginning of time to be at the manger, to worship, his, to, to welcome God into the world in the flesh are shepherds. Because this child, this Savior will be for all people. And here's the first example. It's for the shepherds. Do not fear. Have hope. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Because he'll be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I defy you to write a better sentence in the English language than the one I just read for you. That's the best news. Great news. We are not to fear. We have so many reasons not to fear but to have hope. And again, it's such, a, it's such a crummy year this year and hopefully it doesn't go over in 2021, but it probably will. I don't know. We, we cannot succumb to fear. Um, one of the things that I put together, I found this on the internet uh, from a group, but it's 145 verses 
to not fear, to have hope. I, they're back on the welcome table if you want to grab one on the way out. I didn't make a ton of copies, so if we run out, I can get you. You can email me or I can make them for next week. But grab a copy. If this is you and you say, you know what, if you're honest enough about yourself and what you struggle with and you're honest and say, you know what, I, 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 I am struggling right now. I am. I, I, I fear, anxiety, worry. It, I, I get it. Grab this on the way out. And, and for the next 145 days, you can look at a verse throughout Scripture that gives you a reason to have hope, to not fear. Because we need this. We need this in times like this. We need the Christmas story. We need to be thinking and meditating on this Christmas story. Christmas is great. And it's got a lot of great feelings and emotions attached to it. But as Christians, we need to be thinking Christians, studying Christians, Christians who meditate on the Christmas story, not just for warm fuzzies, but for the truth that's in the Christmas story. That we can battle back, spiritually battle back against despair, against hopelessness, against fear, and the answers to fear right here in the Christmas story. You don't have to go beyond the Christmas story to read through it, and God will equip you with what you need to say no to fear. No to worry, no to anxiety, no to hopelessness, no to despair. It's all right here. Even today, as you look at him, God hears us, Zechariah. He hears your prayer. He's heard every prayer you've ever prayed. Every utterance, every, everything that's come out of your mouth, out of your mind, God has heard that and answered that. God favors us. We see that in Mary, that we are greatly favored. We have found grace. We have found grace. Uh, from, from, from Jesus Christ. And he acts for us. We learn that from the story of Joseph. God is acting on your behalf. This is from the Holy Spirit. May that be your mantra for Christmas. This is from the Holy Spirit. God's in control. And fourthly, as we look at the shepherds, God is born for us, for all people. All people, uh, he has been born for us. So uh, remember, Christmas is a time for hope, not despair. To fight back, find weapons to fight against fear and despair. Find it in the Christmas story. Find it in a, in a pamphlet if you want to grab one again back on the welcome desk. Uh, fight back at Christmas. And not only for yourself, for, for those around you, for your family, for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren that look to you. What a time in, in COVID and unrest and all the things going on in the news. Every time you turn the news on, some, we shouldn't even be watching news. Turn the news on and it's all these reasons to despair. How many of your kids, grandkids, neighbors, uh, great grandkids are watching you? Grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, uncle, whatever you might be, are watching you and how you respond. And if you respond with hope and goodness and the gospel, what a powerful witness you can have in this time. What a powerful witness we can have as children of God in this time. Let's go ahead and pray about that. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind and of self-control, that your Holy Spirit works inside of us all the time. He encourages us. He strengthens us. He gifts us. He ministers to us. He prays for us, Lord. He has, so, he has such a multifaceted uh, ministry in the believer's life. We can't even name all the things that he does and how active he is in our lives, Lord. And right now, in this year, at this time, and this Christmas season, Lord, he is active and encouraging and giving us hope that we would not to succumb to fear, Lord. There, there, as we look around in our flesh, we see a lot of good reasons to fear, a lot of good reasons to worry, a lot of good re reasons to be controlled by our anxiety. Help that not to be true for us, Lord. Help us to use wisdom. N not to say naively that there is nothing bad out there that we should worry about or fear, Lord. Not, not respond in naiv naivety, Lord, but in hopefulness and in trust in you to see the real dangers and the things around us and not to minimize them, Lord, but to respond in hope, not fear. Help us to do that and do that well. It's hard to do that, Lord. It's hard. It's very hard. We're, we're so prone to fear. We're prone to that. We, we want to go there, Lord, but help us not to. Help us to fight. Help the Holy Spirit to, 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 to care for us, to keep us safe from our own sinfulness, our own fears, Lord. Help us to look to the Christmas story and to your scriptures to battle fear, to do real spiritual battle against, against fear in our hearts and around us, Lord. May we not be people of fear, but people of the gospel, of gospel hope, Lord, because that's the only hope we have. Help us to do that, Lord. Bless us, Lord. Give us each a Merry Christmas, Lord. Uh, Lord, those that are watching online, those that are here, Lord, our loved ones around us, it'll be a hard Christmas for many of us, Lord, but may it be uh, a hopeful Christmas and not a fearful one. 
And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. And uh, as we dismiss, uh, there's a lot of things. Remember, our reading plan for the year. We as a church like to read through the Bible together. Our memorization plan for the year is outside. You'll find it on the back table behind the sound booth. You'll find, if you want reasons for hope, you can find that at the welcome desk on the way out. That's there as well. All sorts of things happening. Remember this Thursday, Thursday night is Christmas Eve. Am I right? Thursday night, yeah, Friday's Christmas. We'll be here at 7 o'clock for our candlelight service. It's always a great service, uh, and we would love to have you there uh, as well. But uh, let, me, let me pray uh, as we dismiss to go. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would bless us and that you would keep us in your love and in your care, that you would lift your countenance towards us, Lord, that you would bring us peace, that you would bring us hope, that truth would reign this Christmas season, that hope would reign this Christmas season, Lord. May it be true for David's Community Bible Church. Bless us as we leave today, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen.